Hello, BookTube. Yesterday, Matt at Paperback Junkie, uh, a channel that I'm assuming you'll also subscribe to. He's he's awesome. I will leave a link uh, down below. But yesterday, he did uh, the Scholars book tag from Josh at Literary Gladiators. Josh created the Scholars book tag. And at the end, he uh, in his description box, he tagged me. Uh, perhaps he's not completely fluent in my 5,800 videos, or he'd have remembered that I did the Scholars book tag back in May. Uh, and I had a blast doing it, but it's one of those tags uh, that you can do over and over again, at least that I can do over and over again, because it's all about literary reputation. And a large a large part of it is about authors who aren't as well-known as they should be or are forgotten. And uh, like Matt, I specialize in those kinds of authors. So so I thought I would just do it again with a whole new roster of people. Uh, why not? Uh, it's uh, The more I can sing these people's praises, the better, although I'm, I don't have the ear of a publishing house, so I'm, I'm not able to change things except to get maybe some of you thinking along the same lines, because some of you will create publishing houses. <laughs> but anyway, uh, question number one is, which lesser-known writer do you feel more people need to read and study? And if the key here is study, then my answer would be an author named Vespasiano, Vespasiano de Bastici, who was a, a 15th century Renaissance writer, a bookman, a uh, uh, library consultant. He he. That's where he made most of his money. He consulted with rich people about their libraries. Who they just created a big annex to a mansion. They're going to have potentates from all over the region come to visit. They want people to be wowed by their library, so they get an expert to fill it. Um, speaking of someone who has done that work for money, uh, it's fascinating creating a library for someone who is admitting to you they're not going to use it themselves. <laughs> but, well, it's, it, it becomes an, uh, an exercise in creating sort of a platonic ideal of a library. It's a lot of fun and very, very lucrative. <laughs> but uh, but uh, he wrote as well, in addition to, to producing books and consulting on books and whatnot, he, he also wrote. And one of the things that he wrote throughout his life was a collection, a sort of ragtag collection of shorter and longer Mini biographies of the illustrious men of his day, the, the famous and powerful men of his day, in all walks of life, from from popes to uh, to mercenary general captains, uh, and that work has often been trimmed and edited and packaged uh, uh, over the years as you know one variation or another on illustrious men of the 15th century, and I think it's had a, an English translation, maybe one, maybe two, uh, but never a big fat penguin classics translation with with full annotations and an introduction and and a setting that allows modern day readers to say that not only is this an invaluable treasure trove of contemporary 15th century writing but it's also really entertaining it's really really good and also more than that Vespasiano I mean yes it's it's an absolute gold mine of of details and personality quirks for these major and minor figures in history but also there's a, a wisdom running throughout so many of these little vignettes and throughout the book as a whole that is underappreciated. And the reason it's underappreciated is because it would be American critics who would do the appreciating and <laughs> they can't read the book. It's, there, there aren't editions. There should be multiple editions. Uh, but so anyway, Vespasiano, I will write all these things down below. Vespasiano would be my, my choice. I seem to remember there was a paperback English translation of at least a portion of this work a long time ago. That's not very good. You shouldn't have to say that. Uh, question number two, which well-known writer do you feel garners too much attention? And of course, if you've been watching this channel, you know that I feel that about a lot of writers. Uh, I, in the last hundred years, I could go through a long roster of them. A big, big example would be uh, Ernest Hemingway, whose books are serviceable at best, and yet he is absolutely venerated. He is the, at the absolute peak of the American pantheon for non-literary reasons, because he is, he is the, uh, the, the, you know, the Lord of the Nazgul when it comes to dude bro lit. He, he is not just writing, he's a way of reading. He's a way of writing. That's the key to his appeal, is, isn't what he wrote, it's how he did it. So invariably, you'll have 20-something young men who say, well, tonight I'm going to savor a good book. And on Instagram, they'll put a picture of how they're going to savor that good book. And it's with hard grain alcohol and a cigar, which has nothing to do with books. All it has to do is killing your body. So, and Hemingway glorified that and has been glorified in turn for that. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Uh, and, and it, 
it in turn bootstrap glorifies second rate literature but you could you could extend that i could extend that all the way to the present day elsa ferranti is a, a perfect example of an author who writes pedestrian work that has been enormously catapulted into the, the heights of renown and people chattering and talking about it for extra literary reasons because she, she didn't publish a mailing address <laughs> and that happens a lot so i could do that with a lot of authors uh uh question number three a writer or work you think will be in the canon in 2050 and i said in my may version of this of this tag uh, i don't have any faith in the canon anymore i know a number of college undergraduates and i know a, a surprisingly large number of them who are coming in as freshmen here in boston uh this fall and i've seen their syllabuses i've seen i've seen what what their required reading is and it's virtually unrecognizable and i know why it's unrecognizable. It's unrecognizable because the authors and the works are being chosen for political reasons rather than literary reasons, even in classes that are about literature. And that leads me to think that in academia, there is no such thing as a class that's about literature anymore. They're all going to be about politics. They're all going to be about whether or not you, your, your author was woke, about whether or not your author exercised you know, toxic masculinity or whatever. And the authors will be avoided on those grounds only and no consideration will be given whatsoever to whether or not their work is any good. In other words, again, extra literary factors will rule the roost. And if that's true, then who knows what will be in the canon in 2050. It won't, there won't be an actual canon in 2050 because the actual canon, despite what you, what extremely earnest, horn rim glasses, humorless young people who know everything and don't want to hear that they don't know everything, despite what they may have told you how when they cornered you at a family barbecue to tell you how horrible you are, Despite what they might have told you, the canon existed for its 7,000 years because of the quality of the works, not because of the oppressive quotient of the writer. <laughs> there, there, there are reasons why these things were in the canon, and the smallest reason of all was because of the, the white male privilege of the authors. That was the smallest reason of all. Whether you have been told that or not, it's, it's still true. Uh, and when you get rid of that, when you say, or rather when you target that, when you, when you are an academic, freshman, you know, introduction to literature or whatever, and you look at the canon that you learned, at these books that moved you, and you say, well, I'm going through this list and I don't like what I see, <laughs> not one bit at all. Uh, there, there's, there are no polyamorous authors, there are no authors who are... Uh, intersex there are no there are no authors on this list at all that reflect the imagined conditions of my students <laughs> the my students need to see themselves not a version of themselves not an, a version they could aspire to or a version they could avoid they need to see themselves an exact one-to-one -one reflection and if they don't see themselves in a work of literature that liter that work of literature is bad <laughs> never in a million years did i think that such insane thinking would come to to academia and yet it, it is there and it's entrenched there. So I look at the syllabuses of the incoming freshmen here in Boston. And I, <laughs> if that's true in 2018, then in 20, 2050, th there'll be nothing at all. There'll be just, it will be unrecognizable. It will be, uh, your literature class will be the latest blog entries by your friends. And it won't just be that you snicker at the idea of reading Montaigne or Shakespeare, it will be that everyone does, and that it, it's it's not only a sign of bad taste, it's sort of wrong. It's wrong think. And uh, I'm glad I won't be able to see it. A, a, a generation that does that to itself with its own cultural heritage deserves what happens to it. And I think history is pretty clear on what will happen. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, question number four, a less ranty subject, is a writer from your area that you think deserves more attention. Uh, and again, I, I have, when I did this the last time, uh, many, many names came to mind. And uh, the same thing was true this time. I, I picked just, uh, when I was jotting down these notes, I picked uh, Cornelia Wells Walker, who was uh, a critic for the, the dear old Boston Evening Transcript when her brother, uh, Lind, was the, was the editor. And she, because her, her brother was the editor and because she was much smarter than he was and much better writer than most of the people on the Evening Transcript's payroll, even though some of them went on to become very famous, 
uh, because of those things, she got to write about whatever she wanted. So she did book reviews, she did theater reviews, she did uh, um, all sorts of opinion pieces, and they were wonderful. Oh my, her prose was wonderful. Cut glass, just as sharp and clear as cut glass. And that was there was something of that in her personality as well. She she did not suffer fools gladly, and she uh, she had a wonderfully malicious sense of humor, and just carried everything before her. What did she was also uh, beautiful. This was this was in the late 1830s, so I don't think there are any pictures of her. But nevertheless, uh, she cast a spell wherever she went, and then dispelled that spell with her prose, which was vicious. <laughs> and uh, the reason that she, I think, she would even be a small footnote in literary history isn't for those columns and reviews because they're gone. Somewhere down in the bowels of the Boston Athenaeum or the Boston Public Library, there may be copies of the Boston Evening Transcript. I would, if there are, I would strongly urge people to either digitize them or go down there and find everything by Cornelia and get it written, get, get it get it copied so that it doesn't die when those documents die. But it, that isn't the reason. I mean, she wrote a ton of prose like that, and it was all wonderful. It was all just so much fun. Uh, and also cutting. She had a lot of opinions on the subjects of her day, and some of those opinions uh, will, will give her woke credit in the 21st century, and some of them won't. If I remember correctly, she was against the women's suffrage movement, but a lot of really smart women were. They they had their reasons. They, uh, just I think it was mostly came down to an adventurous versus a conservative mind frame. If you have a conservative mind frame, you will prefer a system, even one that disenfranchises you, over something new. Uh, but one way or another, her writing on the subject is great, even if you don't agree with it. I, I don't have to agree with a lot of her opinions uh, to to love her prose. But I don't think that would be the reason. The reason that she's probably a minor footnote in literary history somewhere is because when her brother, Lind, who was an easy, he was an easygoing guy, he was a, okay, whatever you say kind of guy, it was very enjoyable to know, but not perhaps the perfect type of person to be a newspaper editor. <laughs> uh, and when he died, she took over. She became the editor of the Boston Evening Transcript in the 1840s, a woman as a newspaper editor in the 1840s, uh, which had to have made, uh, certainly she was the first woman to ever do that job in Boston, and it had to make her one of the first ones in the country. Uh, and she did a great job. She, she did a fantastic job. She, she wrote a lot. She managed everybody. She uh, handled... Um, established male writers who thought, well, now that a little lady's in charge of the newspaper, uh, I'll be able to have my way. She handled them quite well in the best way possible. She saw right through them, same as Kay Graham did uh, 200 years later. Uh, so uh, it would be her. <laughs> I will leave all these notes down below. But uh, if, if the question is, uh, deserves more recognition, I would say that she deserves more recognition. And the form I would like that recognition to take would be a collected edition of her work, which is never going to happen. Uh, and then, uh, so Cornelia Wells Walter, it, it, it's, she's, she's a figure. I don't know that you could learn anything about her. There'll never be a statue to her, as far as I know. No plaque, no nothing like that. But uh, a pioneer, and also a heck of a writer. And anyway, anyway, uh, question number five is a deceased writer that you think should have won the Nobel Prize. Now, my opinions on the Nobel Prize are well known on this channel. Uh, it's a joke. It's it's dead right now, and I hope it stays dead. It, it died when it awarded uh, the Nobel Prize in Literature to Bob Dylan. Uh, that was the end of the Nobel Prize for anything other than shock value. I, I think even Dylan's most partisan uh, fans had to have realized on some level that he only won the prize in order to shock the world. And then he pulled down his pants and disgraced the prize by not accepting it, by dithering, by saying, well, I don't know, this this car commercial probably takes precedence over going to Stockholm. <laughs> One way or another. Uh, for the purposes of this question, I want to think up an idealized version of the Nobel. Uh, a perfect international literary award. The thing that Nobel should have been, uh, but has for so long not been, as the, the, the judges get together, they don't read at all. All they want is to, is to command a headline cycle, which is an absolutely horrible, corrosive attitude for a major award to have. So what I'm thinking of instead is kind of international version of what I consider, I of course 
uh, considered to be one of the best literary awards, which is the National Book Critics Circle Award, uh, which is awarded every year in a bunch of categories by the National Book Critics Circle, which is a collection of people who read books critically for a living. So you don't have any cross signals or all sorts of counter narratives like you do, for instance, in the latest man, book, or long list, where it's easy, even, again, if you are a partisan of the prize, it is easy to look at the long list and say, well, okay, these writers were following an agenda. They weren't judging the literature by its merits in front of them. They were, they were making a long list of books they themselves want to see on the long list, regardless of the, the quality of the work for their own personal reasons, and then those reasons are always narrow, and the reason the reasons are narrow is because these people have a different profession. They're writers, not critics. Whereas in the National Book Critics Circle, it's, it's book critics who make, who make the calls. They make the list, they choose the winners. Uh, I think that makes eminent sense. <laughs> I think that makes absolutely eminent sense. Why, why in the world would you invite oblivious carpetbaggers in to judge the merits of something they don't personally steep themselves in. Wouldn't you want experts to judge an award? So I'm going to say, for the purposes of this, of this question or the next one, I'm going to say not so much the Nobel Prize, but a version of the Nobel Prize that had the same prestige, the same money, the same history, but that had been run all along the right way by an international band of, uh, of book critics. Uh, and if we say that, if we say that idealized version of the Nobel Prize, and it's a deceased writer who should have won, uh, the first name that came to mind is Vasily Grossman, a, a great Russian writer who was, you know, brutalized by the, the Soviet system and, and never got, I mean, he wrote a, um, a lot. He wrote a lot of books, some of which scandalously have not been translated. And he wrote a lot of, uh, of incidental deadline prose, none of which has been translated as far as I know. And he also wrote a towering masterpiece of world literature, Life and Fate. A gigantic novel called Life and Fate, which is one of those Russian novels. I don't know what they put in the water over there, but it's one of those Russian novels that can stand right alongside War and Peace as just this towering, multifaceted achievement of literature. Uh, and I, Grossman would, in my idealized version of the Nobel Prize, he would have won uh, the year that that he wrote the the year that that Life and Fate was smuggled to the West it would have won that award and embarrassed the Soviets uh, and given him a stature that maybe could have made his life a little better. Uh, and then the next question is a living writer you think should receive the Nobel Prize. And again, we're going to talk about this idealized Nobel Prize. And I think Marilyn Robinson, I, I think I have, I've had drastically mixed re reactions to some of her books, but this is a, an extremely committed, extremely intelligent and extremely eloquent author. Who's just been honestly working away at her craft, right in front of us for years and years and years. And that, that recognition would be good. <laughs> a big, big scale recognition would be good. I'm sure that it will come in due course anyway. Probably she'll write, her, her next book will probably be a gigantic masterpiece, or the one after that. And then the, the world will, will turn around, the critical world will turn around and say, you know, we really haven't venerated her as much as we should. But, uh, I mean, she's been venerated, but I, she could stand a little more. I, I've had my ups and downs with her as an author, but boy, oh boy, she's the real deal. So uh, for a living author, she would be my choice. Uh, then question number seven is, a writer you feel needs a complete anthology. And for this, we're going to turn to the realms of science fiction, to one of the greats of science fiction, uh, Alfred Bester, who wrote uh, The Star is My Destination, and he wrote uh, The Demolished Man, an absolute classic of, of science fiction. And yet, he wrote a, a bunch of other stuff as well, a huge amount of stuff. And again, like I thought last time I did this this tag, I thought about an author where it wouldn't be one book that would be an anthology. It would instead be a unified collection. It would be like a, a box with a with beautiful spine that makes a picture, one of those kinds of things. And, and, and with new introductions and uh, a series introduction and lots of notes and... The whole critical apparatus. That's what I would like. Would be a Bester box, <laughs> a box of Bester, where you get all of his novels, most some of which have been out of print for decades, uh, and all of his short stories, some of which are incredible, and many of which have not been reprinted anywhere near the extent that they should be, and maybe a bunch of other stuff too. It's, he never stopped writing, as long as he could, he, he kept writing, uh, and, and all of it is so smart and so worth reading and preserving. Then, I, I, what I would want for what, how does the question put it? Uh, a complete anthology. I would want a, a complete set of Alfred Bester. I'm hoping that somewhere out there, 
some somebody in a position to influence the the list of a major science fiction publishing house considers maybe doing that because uh, it, it's uh, it's well worth doing and, and it would be a nice uh, counter move to the horrible way that sci-fi and fantasy tend to respect their elders <laughs> they that it tends not to happen <coughs> uh, but anyway that would be this time around it would be Alfred Bester and then question number eight is a translated work you feel deserves a recognition uh, and I, I think the last time I did this tag I I chose uh, somebody who hadn't been translated or hadn't been translated enough. Certainly the author that I want to talk about now has had some works translated, but not nearly all of his work and not nearly in enough translations and not anything, I think, even remotely recently. Another Soviet author, uh, Vladimir Voinovich, who did, uh, he did a gigantic, uh, he wrote, he wrote uh, deadpan comic novels mocking the Soviet system while being a Soviet citizen. Uh, not an easy thing to do, and it, it ran him afoul of the government and, and uh, whatnot, got him into exile, and got him uh, unpersoned, unplatformed, that sort of thing. The books are incredibly good. They have a quintessentially Soviet deadpan comedy to them. Uh, he wrote, well, there's one little book of his called The Fur Hat that you just you just have to read it. Well, it's, it's hilarious. Uh, but he wrote a lot of other stuff, too. Some of it more serious than others, a lot of it very long. And there aren't this is this is an author. There are many, many such authors, but this is an author where we should have new editions, new translations regularly. And, and it doesn't happen. Instead, a publisher who wants to do a new translation will go to somebody to do yet another new Iliad, yet another new Aeneid. When okay, we we have a whole library of new Iliads and new Aeneids. It might be time. To, to start risking some money on the fact that Americans will read works in translation if you interest them. Uh, and and Voinovich would be, uh, he'd be one of my foremost candidates. He, he's, he deserves more attention in translation. He also deserves more translations. Uh, and then question number nine is a work of nonfiction that you feel needs to be studied. And last time I did this tag, I mentioned a contemporary work. David K. Johnson's It's Even Worse Than You Think, his book about the, the, the first 70 days of the Trump administration. Uh, and I want to continue that with, with this one. I want to mention two contemporary books. I think they both came out last year, and they stand out. They really do. The, con, the, the typical caution that people make about contemporary works of nonfiction is you don't know how well it will stand up over time. So you don't know whether or not to recommend it. But uh, I've seen a lot more time than a lot of people who say that. And these two works are incredible. They are both brutally depressing. They're both brutally dark, but well worth your time uh, to read as, as real-time historical analyses of our own present moment. Uh, the first one is uh, The People Are Going to Rise Like Waters Upon Your Shore by Jared uh, Yates Sexton. Uh, and they're both about the same. These are both about the same subject. That's about the you know, the middle America rage that allegedly elected Donald Trump. Uh, and the second one is Everything You Love Will Burn by by uh, Vegas Tenold, uh, which is about sort of the flip side of that. It's it's about another of the strong elements that help get Donald Trump elected, which is the rise of white nationalism, the rise of, the rise of uh, this, this modern iteration of the Ku Klux Klan. In, in America, I, I, I never know what to say. I, I never know how to how far to go along when people call them white nationalists. Uh, it's the Klan. It's just the Klan. It doesn't look like the Klan, but that's all that it is. Every element, every tenet is exactly the same from the routine and absolutely acidic anti-Semitism to the offhand sexism to the race hatred and race baiting to the bullying tactics to the, the fascist you know, hobnailed boots to whatnot. It's all the clan. It's exactly, they, oper they operate exactly the same way. They market themselves exactly the same way. So it, white nationalists, I guess, because Vegas Tunnel does that in his book, but uh, it's terrific. It's, it, these two books are terrific. So I will, I will note them down below. If you want to read about what happened to America in 2016, these are two of the best books to read on that subject. Uh, and then question number 10 is, if you could teach five literature-based classes, what would they be? I came up with five ideal classes. Last time I sort of tongue-in-cheek listed five classes that I myself have already taught in places from, from Hawaii to the American Midwest. Uh, but, and in Germany. One of them was, was taught in Germany. Uh, but 
uh, this time around, I imagined five classes that I would like to teach. Uh, the first one is dogs and literature, of course. Uh, the next one is the pulp roots of superheroes. So before Superman appears in action comics, in, in pulp literature and in pulp magazines, what were the roots of the the idea of superheroes that would then take off in a massive way in the late 1930s. Not just Philip Wiley's The Gladiator, but all the other stuff, the stuff that's forgotten, uh, including, you know, proto-superheroes like The Shadow or Doc Savage. I'd love to teach that class. Uh, nobody would sign up for it, but I'd love to teach it. Uh, number three would be the literature of colonial Egypt. Egypt, when it was a, a colonial possession of the, of the British crown produced an enormous amount of literature, most of which was local and most of which is forgotten. And it, some of it has has later flowerings in writers like Naguib Mahfouz, but, but most of the literature that I'm thinking of is not known to the West anymore. And some of it is very, very good. <laughs> so all, it takes all kinds of forms, but it's extremely smart, uh, some of it. So I'd love to assemble it all. God knows where I'd find the, the source materials, but, but I'd love to assemble it all and teach a class on what it all meant and, and some of the themes that unite it all. Uh, then number four would be American political fiction. Americans love politics and they love writing novels about politics. They've, they've always liked doing that. I would love to do a class on that. Of course, the, the two crown jewels would be the two greatest political novels ever written, uh, All the King's Men, uh, and by Robert Penn Warren, and The Last Hurrah by Edwin O'Connor. But there would be lots of others. The Gay Place, People Will Always Be Kind. And going back into, you know, colonial and immediately post-colonial literature, where people were writing about politics, whether they were openly about it or, or not, I would love to do a class on that and what it all means, how, how it reflects the current political landscape. Uh, I would even... <laughs> I might even, as a as a sort of a PS, do a, a final class in that, uh, a final meeting in that class on uh, American political fi fiction that was written by American political figures. <laughs> that one, that might be fun. Uh, and uh, the last class would be the importance of Erasmus, <laughs> which you saw coming a mile away, as he's he's one of the most forgotten of one of the greatest authors. He's one of the greatest authors who's the most forgotten. He's remembered now only as the author of The Praise of Folly, and that only in classes, in school. No one reads The Praise of Folly for fun. And they don't read anything else that he wrote at all. And that's a shame, because he spent his whole life writing, and in his life he was the most famous man in the world because of his writing. Uh, and all of it, in the, right, in the hands of the right translator with the right notes, all of it will work today and would be amazingly good. <laughs> it's amazingly interesting to read. I can, and I feel certain <laughs> that I could convey that to an audience of young people. Uh, and that's it. That is the, the scholars book tag take two. Uh, the final question is who do you tag? But this is an old tag. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that lots and lots of people have already been tagged in it. So I'm not going to tag anybody, although I'd love to see if you haven't done it and you're of a scholarly, if these questions appeal to you and do it by all means. Uh, but I want to thank, I want to thank Matt for thinking of me. I never know, I never know quite what to think about when people tag me on stuff like this, because despite the fact that I've been around BookTube for two years, I don't know how BookTube thinks of me at all. Not, not whatsoever. I, I, am I the, the weird old guy who likes Meg or am I, I have no idea. I have no idea whatsoever in, out in the real world, in the book world, in the, in the book critic world. When I have critics over here, when I talk to, to people who are either new to me or who are old friends, they give me a clear idea of how they view me out in that world. But in the world of BookTube, I have no idea. <laughs> so so, so I, I'm going to take it. I'm going to decide to take it as a compliment that Matt tagged me in a, in a, in a tag called the Scholar's Book Tag. Uh, one way or another, it was a blast to do. I love talking about these vanished people, these people that nobody reads, <laughs> that, that people should. They, if you crack them open, well, you can't uh, You can't crack open some of the people that I mentioned in this tag, but if you were to find, for instance, some of the works that I've mentioned that have been printed, I think you would really like them, and it's great to champion people like that. For instance, of course, on this list, I, I, of course, I want to give number one place to Praise of Folly, uh, but Praise of Folly was written quickly, and it was written to amuse, and it was full of full of acid, and it is very topical. You would need notes to really understand a lot of what it's doing. The, the notes would help you to do that, and then you would see how brilliant it is. But in terms of the books mentioned, so just in this tag alone, the one that I'm thinking of most in terms of what you might not have read that you really would love is Life and Fate by Vasily Grossman, an incredible novel that not a lot of people, even who love incredible novels, have read. 
uh, but anyway, uh, anyway, I'm going to, I just went on too long. So I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back soon. Thank you, book two.